everyone. Welcome to the Others Podcast. I am your host, Stephen Penny. Uh, we're going away from our usual scheduled programming this week. Uh, we're not going to talk about a specific track at all this week because as much as I appreciate all of our guests that join me every week, we've got an, another special guest, I would say, this week. This week, this uh, this month, whenever this, this podcast goes out. But we've got one of the OG members of Spy Mob, member of NERD, uh, a, a good friend of our other friend of the podcast, Brent, and that is Eric Fawcett. How you doing, man? Steve, it's a great pleasure being here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I'm sure that other people listening really appreciate it. I know they always love it when Brent comes on and talks about the old days and tells us all about his... Uh, his musical experiences with the likes of Pharrell and Chad and NERD. So it's going to be great hearing from you as well, I hope. Well, I hope so too. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get into it. Let's get into you know, your kind of, your background. So obviously, most people listening to this will, will hopefully know who you are and what you do. But you obviously are the drummer with, with Spy Mob. That's right, yep. How did you... What first got you into music and why why the drums specifically? Yeah, I think I think there will always be a little bit of mystery as to what it was about drums that, that really fascinated me. I grew up in a big family. I had four older sisters and they were playing music all the time. So I was born into a nest filled with music and sound all the time. And I grew up in the 80s, 70s and 80s. And so when I was growing up, there was Joni Mitchell playing and Stevie Wonder and Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Crosby, Stills and Nash and just all this great music. And then when I fell in love with music, I it was Kiss. Kiss just captivated my imagination when I was seven. And Peter Chris was a god, a drumming god to me. And I have no idea what it was about the drums, but when I was about seven or eight, I uh, I just really wanted a drum set. And I was at uh, a friend of my sister's house and there was a drum set in the basement. And I looked at it and my imagination just went wild. And uh, I, I, to this day, I don't know what it was, but I just knew that I had to play the drums. And for my for Christmas when I was nine, my dad got me a set of drums and uh, I would just play with records and play on my own. And I'm surprised that my hearing lasted until adulthood because I would just put on headphones and put on my sister's records and, and play along with, uh, with the records days and days and days and nights. And somehow my family put up with it. And then in seventh grade, I formed a, a band with uh, two friends who were brothers the band was called outrage and outrage lasted throughout the rest of our junior high and high school years and uh that was kind of the beginning was that your own music you were doing in that band or covers or yeah it was mostly covers we did write we wrote songs as well but it was mostly a cover band and we were really damn good and <laughs> we were a novelty in our town we were kind of like uh we would enter the battle of the bands at the university in our town in Ames, Iowa, Iowa State University, huge university, like 30,000 students. And there would be some really good bands that we'd compete with, but we were like this novelty band. We were just these kids and we could play. We would play a lot of Rush covers. And, you know, listening back to the tapes now, the, <laughs> the covers weren't really super true to Rush form but for our age they were amazing and so we would take first at these battle of the bands um but we would all, but uh most of the covers we'd play were really party friendly covers and we would bop all over iowa and play formals and dances and proms and uh fundraisers and we were a, a busy a busy cover band for about six years before college. Did you learn anything from that experience for all those kind of years doing that um, as, I guess, you know, uh, a kind of hobby um, and take 
did any of that kind of help as you became a professional musician in terms of uh, the songwriting and things like that? And again, it, it's very, I don't know that many musicians, but is it generally quite rare for a drummer to also be a songwriter as well in terms of uh, in a band? Yeah, so there are a lot of ideas there. I think the most important, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about getting your 10,000 hours in as a whatever your craft is, whether you're a basketball player, a songwriter, or a musician. And for us, those years of playing, and we would play, if not, I mean, not without exaggerating, we would play almost every day. I would just go over to their two brothers home and we would just play all day and they had a swimming pool in the backyard we'd play we'd go swim in the swimming pool we'd come back I'd sit on my vinyl throne and get a chapped ass and then keep playing and then go out and swim in the swimming pool and we we you know we were imitating all day long we were imitating uh, the police you know, we were imitating you know whatever songs were huge on the radio we would play Genesis and Thomas Dolby and um we were learning from the masters and we got those 10,000 hours in really, really early. And for us, it wasn't a hobby. We really wanted to be successful as a band, which is why we started writing um, songs as well. And we didn't have a real disciplined, you know, later on I learned what it really takes to be a great songwriter. Um, the way we were writing songs was a lot of like, you know, someone would come, with an idea and uh, we would woodshed it and work it out. And, but we were, we got, we, we got happy with where the song arrived too soon. And so the songs never really became great. We didn't learn until later, like what it really takes to hone a song, but we did learn the basic process of it. And um, it was an incredible early education. When I went to college I went to college with the idea that I had sort of lost the sense that being in a rock band was um, the most responsible thing to do for someone who wanted to have a family one day and um, be a responsible citizen. So I, when I went to college, I kind of put away the idea of becoming a musician. Um, I did have a band in college that was a super fun party band that was successful for what it was on campus, but it was never something that I took seriously. And music by then was something that I had mostly put behind me as a, as a goal. And we kind of spoke briefly the other day and you mentioned about your, um, your kind of college education and uh, being able to kind of go to the UK and in, into Europe and stuff. But your obviously what you studied was a million miles away from, from music. So when you kind of put the the music stuff on hold and, and studied and things, was that there was no dream at that point to kind of continue at some point with the music or were you just looking at other options? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I went to, my sisters went to uh, public universities here in the United States. And here, when we say public, that means that it's state funded and, um, they were great schools. Um, an opportunity arose for me to go to a liberal arts college, which was unique in my family. And I think f for me, when I went to college, I had, I felt a responsibility to take the academic side really seriously. And I wasn't sure what that was going to mean for me because before that school was always pretty easy for me, but it wasn't something that I poured my passion into. Music was where I poured my passion. So when I arrived at college, all I knew is that I really wanted to work hard. And what surprised me was how much I loved it. So suddenly, I wasn't very social. I read all the time because I'm not a fast reader. And I loved this sort of hermit life of <laughs> diving into my books and and I fell in love with the subject of the history of science. There was something about looking at the history of ideas and seeing how human beings become fascinated with different questions, not necessarily because the empirical evidence is pointing us in new directions, but because of all kinds of social pressures that impinge upon like, why do we ask 
Why do we ask if the sun is the center of the universe or if the earth is the center of the universe? Why do we ask what gravity is? Why do we ask if there's true chance in the universe or if everything is, you know, just billiard balls bouncing around? I became fascinated with these kinds of questions. And yeah, it led to me spending a year at Oxford for my uh, junior year. And that's when I would go see concerts in London or around the UK and had no idea that years later I would be coming back and playing those venues myself. And in terms of when you were studying that, what was the kind of potential end goal there? Was it to go into a certain profession, a certain field? Was it to become a teacher or did you have any ideas about what you wanted to do with that kind of that degree? Yeah, well, at the time, very much so. I, I wanted to get a PhD and teach and do research and write about it. Um, which, when you compare it to my previous goal of being a professional rock drummer, where you're just like this lunk-headed skin thrasher, <laughs> one, with drumming, like you're very much in the world and you're hitting things with clubs. And then in this new sort of dream of mine, you're just, you know, if you're studying the history of science, you know, you're in this ivory tower writing in these esoteric subjects that about eight people are going to read. So one is a very sort of removed from the world way of being. And the other one, you know, was very much like this physical tactile approach. And I think for me, you know, I did get accepted to a great PhD program for the history of science after college. But when John Osby, the lead singer of Spy Mob and keyboardist for NERD, um, called me. He was a bandmate from my college party band, and he called me a year after we had graduated from college, and he played songs for me over the phone, and he said, do you want to form a band? And I was literally en route to start my program at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and he played me these songs, and there there was suddenly this like decision to be made. Do I spend the next 60 years of my life in studying this subject that's passionate to me, that I love, but is really sort of out there, and I'm going to attend conferences with <laughs> about 100 people and the only 100 people in the world who think the way I do? Or am I going to make music and like engage with like collaborators on a daily basis and hit things? Um, and so, in some ways, it was for me. It was sort of like, are you going to live outside the world? Or are you going to live inside the world? And uh, it was in that moment. It was really clear. The choice was really clear. And John's songs were incredible. And that just sort of relit the fire that I had as a kid. That I had really not only sort of put aside, but I was really comfortable with it being put aside. But I do think that there was some denial there too. But I, I, I was never a drummer who was just happy drumming on my own or just drumming for hire. I had to have a bigger mission. And John's call playing me those songs was that greater mission. Like, okay, yeah, I'll drop everything, move to Minneapolis where we at least had some connections and start a band. That's quite a transition. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a transition. I was concerned what my parents were going to say. I was concerned what my sisters were going to think. And in my head, I'd made this, I'd, I'd made this uh, story up that becoming a professional musician and putting all my eggs in that basket was not a smart thing and not the responsible thing to do, but... And when I called my parents, they were like, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> we wondered what happened to your love of music that you expressed every single day of your life before college. Well, that's great. It's great that you, uh, you had that support because I think a lot of parents would be uh, slightly wary if one of their ch children was, uh, yeah, had this potentially this great career ahead of them and they were going to go study more and maybe go into teaching or something themselves and... Yeah, they're sort of giving it up to move away and and starting a band. And obviously, you know, there are, I guess there are there are a million bands that start up around the world 
every day and not many of them actually make it anywhere. It's so true. And I, I do, I talk to high school kids and college students and music school students, any chance I get. I love talking to these young musical and artistic minds. And we do, we talk about the outside pressures that are real uh, when parents say very direct things or relatives say direct things that would disparage any idea of following whatever that dream is. But then we also talk about some of the things that we imagine to be other people's opinions that really aren't there, that they're our own fabrications in our mind that might either be our fear of what they might think, or they might be excuses that we make up to not follow our passions because following our passions and dreams can be really scary. It can be really scary to follow the thing you love most because what if you fail at that thing? So yeah, it's, it was a big jump at the time and it was the first of many, many jumps and sort of leaps of faith that would, that would come later. And had you thought about what might happen if you had failed? Did you, did you think you could go back and study and then follow that path that you, you hadn't previous, previously followed? Did that cross your mind at all? You know, I suppose it probably did cross my mind, but at the time, especially I remember feeling that it was, you know, whether it was, whether this was, this is going to be different for each person. But at the time for me, I felt I was all or nothing. And we, I remember consciously, we would talk about how the idea of a plan B was a dangerous thing because either we were in or we were out. And, you know, I think we all knew that if, if and when the, the ship sank, we were going to be fine. We had figured it out. I think it's safe to say, as given our backgrounds and education, that we had a kind of a privileged standpoint. I don't think anyone was concerned about if we were going to eat. Um, and we weren't married at the time, and we didn't have kids at the time. So we were single. We were in our early 20s, and um, we were just going for it. So I think for me, I, I actually stopped reading history of science books the moment that I decided to form a band. In fact, I found a drum teacher, a brilliant jazz drummer named Phil Hay here in the Twin Cities. And I sought him out and I said, on our first lesson, I said, Phil, I want you to pretend that I've never played the drums before. And we literally started with him putting the sticks in my hands. So not only did I stop thinking about the history of science, I went back and found a teacher who would treat me as if I didn't know a thing about drumming. And for the next few years, my studies were solely in jazz. Not that I wanted to be a jazz drummer because Spy Mob was a blue-eyed soul group. And I would go on to play, you know, hip-hop and funk. But without that jazz foundation, I couldn't, I think, have found some of the interesting sort of not straight but not swung pockets later. So yeah, I really sort of threw myself completely back into music. So had you um, had any kind of formal training before that or had you just been mainly self-taught? I was very resistant to teachers growing up. And looking back, I was petrified. I was petrified of... I think there were a few things going on. I think I was petrified of facing my limitations as a drummer. I was petrified to be pushed into a drumming style direction that wasn't what I loved doing. And I think there was some reason, some good reason for that. I think a lot of the drum teachers, especially in my small town of Ames, Iowa, and then there is a university there, but those drum teachers are very academic. I'm not sure there was a drum teacher in town who would have been able to nurture what I really wanted to do most, which is to just learn popular forms of music. I didn't want to be orchestral. I didn't want to be 
play jazz. I wanted to play funk and pop and rock. So I think that was a tall order for a teacher. But even so, I remember just being really afraid of facing up to what I didn't know, which is common. And I really needed a teacher who could kind of escort me over that threshold. And I I did try a few times, but it didn't work. I think going through college and really learning how to learn and learning how to face my limitations and then feeling that gratification of improving through study. And for me, I think writing, writing English words and sentences was probably the most important learning I did in college. So having that background made me feel like, okay, if I'm going to really do this for a living, if I'm going to have this band and play with this band and maybe be a drummer for others, I need to buckle down and make sure I know my shit. And so that's what those years of study were like. And I mean, I, there were, de- there were days I was practicing six hours in, in a day and I loved it. It was just, I was just back in my childhood dream of becoming a, a professional drummer and then experiencing my growth and then seeing that improvement. It was a really fun and exciting time. And a random question I just kind of thought of, but... Random is great. <laughs> yeah, well, kind of related, but kind of random. Um, what, in, in your opinion, does it take to actually be a good drummer and succeed at that in a, in a professional manner? You know, I'm, I'll answer it this way, and you might want to go back and delete this because I'm not sure I know where I'm going, but a lot of times I'll meet someone and I'll tell them I'm a drummer and they'll say, oh my gosh, you should talk to my nephew. He's a drummer. And I might be introduced to that person, that drummer, and they might be a freaking incredible drummer, but most likely they're a drummer I have very little in common with because... Drummers are like chefs. Like we all kind of do the same thing, but there are so many musical cuisines and there are most of them. I'm really not interested in cooking anything up on the drums. (laughs) Um, I have so much respect for drummers who can play with two kick pedals. And there was a period in my study where I really worked on it. Like I really thought I was interested in it. And I just didn't improve and I didn't improve. And one day I realized it's because you really have no interest in doing this. You don't know what you would do with this in a musical situation. You're not drawn to music where this is happening. So I think the the first mark of a really great drummer is a drummer who knows where their ideas are and knows where their musicality is. In my work at my music company where we create music for film and TV, we have to do a lot of venturing into genres that aren't historically our own genres, and we have to fake it. Or we know a composer who's really good in that world. But usually you can hear it. You know, if it's in the background, you can't really tell if someone's faking it in a scene. But you can tell if a genre is something that a musician or a composer is really at home in. So the, the first way I would answer that is what makes for a great drummer, you know, beyond the things, you know, like keeping time and, you know, it's really, does that drummer feel at home in what she or he is doing? And, and I mean, just to bring this into the world of Pharrell, I think that was one of Pharrell's most incredible contributions to music and of course to hip hop is that if there's a Pharrell track, you know it, at least, you know, historically you really knew when a Pharrell track or a Neptune's track came on and you knew when someone was trying to copy it because it, they, they didn't own it. They, you can't, it's either Pharrell and Chad or it's, it's not. And so that's what I would, you know, find when a person finds their own style and is comfortable in that style and really owns it. Or as Bill Evans, the pianist, says, it's our limitations that define our style far more 
than our capabilities. And I think for those musicians and those drummers specifically who own their limitations as, you know, we're always trying to overcome our limitations, but if we can be find comfort and peace with the limitations that we do have and really own our style, not in spite of them, but also because of them, then we can bring a confidence and ease to our playing that, that you hear in the music, whether you're, it's a thrasher punk band or a math rock band or just a straight ahead groove project. You can really hear it when the drummer is at home. And there are some drummers who cross genres and own them all. And I, those are incredible musicians. You know, those session players who really feel at home in all kinds of genres. That's incredible. And that's just not me. Like there are probably five or six popular forms where I feel like I can really be at home. And beyond them, you know, I'll just tell if I'm on a session and someone's asking me to do something that I feel is outside my comfort zone, I'll just say, you know what, I feel like someone else is probably better for this, especially if it involves two kick pedals. <laughs> <laughs> and has that changed over time at all? Um, as you've kind of got older and grown as a person, but as a musician as well, you know, was there an earlier time where you would maybe just put your hand up and say, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that. I'll, I'll noodle about on that and try and make it work. Whereas then when you're older, you may step back and say, this isn't really my thing. Has that changed over time at all? It really did. There was, so through Spy Mob's life, you know, Spy Mob was my focus. And then Pharrell and Spy Mob were introduced and we worked together in a very organic way that was very much a natural extension of who we were as musicians after and sort of during and after my work with Pharrell and the Neptunes. Um, I spent a lot of time in China working with one artist in particular over there, that was a real natural extension of, of what I had been doing. But I'd also been asked to be part of projects because there was the assumption of, oh, well, he worked with Pharrell or he worked with Wong Lee Home in China. He must be good at, in, in this world. And I would, I would put myself in those situations and, you know, the artist or producer might even be happy. But after those experiences... I would feel like I, like I, like I just put on clothes that just I thought t I was completely ridiculous in, and so I just started saying no to those sessions because I it was it, they weren't interesting, they weren't interesting to do, and then I ultimately started saying no to projects that weren't projects that I had ownership over, you know all the work we did with Pharrell and Chad and Shay and the Neptunes and Nerd. Those sessions were always sessions where we felt like we were contributing to the project in a way that we could own. There was never, you know, from the first time we got together with Pharrell and Chad and Shay and recorded In Search Of, we were there not just to be musicians, but to really bring musical ideas. So all the years that we collaborated with Pharrell and Chay and Chad where we really felt ownership over those projects later on. And actually, you know, before Spy Mob took off, I, I did lots of sessions where looking back, they were great experiences and I didn't say no to anything back then, but there were plenty of situations back then too, where you know, I was not in my comfort zone. Let's, uh, let's jump back to um, the early Spy Mob stuff. So you mentioned you, you moved out to kind of Minneapolis and wanted to kind of start up this band and everything. Were the other guys on board at that point? Was it just yourself and John or how did, how did it kind of come about? Yeah, uh, so we, uh, we moved, it was the summer of 1993 when, we, when John and I moved to Minneapolis and we found a rehearsal space. We got part-time jobs or full-time jobs and food service industry. I think John worked customer service at some, I can't even remember what the company did, but we had these day jobs. And then at night we would practice, you know, John would be writing a lot and we'd be posting ads for 
bass players and guitarists. Um, a, a friend of ours named Scotty Jones formed the band uh, or joined the band on bass that summer. He couldn't come out until later in the summer. And John and I, in the meantime, were auditioning guitarists. And we, God, I, I think we finally did a count of like 25 guitarists. And we were auditioning a guitarist who was really good. We weren't sure if he was the guy, but he was really good. And at the end of the session, he said, listen, I love what you guys have going here. I love the songs that you're writing. But if for some reason you don't think I'm the best match, I know a guy who's tighter than a frog's ass. And you need to audition that guy. His name is Brent Paschke. So Matt guy named Matt Kirkwald, who we're still buddies with, introduced us to Brent Paschke, who was the next guy we auditioned. And during that audition, Brent was writing parts for songs that needed guitar parts. We were, rec <laughs> we were recording Brent's ideas. <laughs> and I don't think we were clear with Brent at that session that we thought he was the guy. And then I think we had him back for a follow-up. And I think I think John and I were just so burnt out on auditioning people that we didn't know how to articulate that, okay, dude, you're hired. So it was at the end of the second audition where John and I were just putting him through the paces, trying different songs and asking him to come up with parts. And Brent was like, guys, what's going on here? Like, is, do I have the gig or not? And we were like, oh, dude, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the gig. <laughs> And, and what's, uh, what's this Brent? What's this Brent guy up to now? Anyone? Anyone out there know what he's doing these days? Oh right, yeah, yeah that Brent guy. Yeah, you know what's what's really, you know, John and I, you know, John and I were roommates by chance. Our first year of college, we were put together by some administration employee, which was, of course, one of the most meaningful chance happenings um, in my entire life. Um, but. What I know about John and me is that like we really knew what good music was you know, at least to in our own minds when we came to college like and especially John John was an incredible student of music he just his he had was kind of a musical encyclopedia so when we encountered Brent like we knew there was something incredibly special about this player. Um, he's from Grand Forks, North Dakota. He comes from a small community and we wondered how someone who didn't have the same kind of access, especially, you know, the internet wasn't a thing, um, the same kind of access to music and concerts, you know, could have developed such an incredibly nuanced and mature sense of musicality who just immediately you know we looked up to him he was a couple of years younger than we were which back then was felt meaningful and suddenly here was this master in the room who i mean talk about a student of music i mean i think brent when we met him was into sort of john frusciante red hot chili pepper style funk but not long after we met like he dove into the meters and he dove into james brown and to witness firsthand how his style was going from this sort of like teenage aggression you know he was a metal god in his hometown brent was and how he sort of massaged that into a much more mature nuanced subtle masterful mastery of vintage funk was incredible and i think that was part of my inspiration for diving into the rigorous, you know, learning that I was doing too. And then throughout all those years, you know, in a band, there are different sort of subgroups. And Brent and I, just from a rhythmic perspective, I mean, we had two great bass players in Spy Mob, uh, Brian Doan Rustler and Christian Twig. But on the top end, like on the hi-hat and snare end of things, it was Brent's right hand and my hi-hat and snare that just... Like I could talk for a really long time about what, how meaningful that relationship is 
right there and what it brought to spy mob and what it brought to NERD and not just in, on the records, but, uh, in, in concert all the time. The loudest thing in my headphones always was Brent. That sounds like a, a future podcast episode idea right there. Mm, yes. Get, get the pair, get the pair of you on a Skype session. Let's do it. So once you've kind of got Spy Mob together and you guys are kind of playing regularly and stuff and making a band of it, you know, Brent's kind of told the tale of how it all um, came about with Pharrell and Chad. You know, you shared, was it a lawyer I think you shared with them that kind of introduced you guys that put your some of your records in front of them? Without repeating the whole story, there was, as our record deal was coming together, we also signed a publishing deal with Famous Music Publishing, which is now part of Sony. And Pharrell happened to know a guy at Famous Music Publishing. I think his name was Brian, but I can't remember for sure. And this guy, Brian, handed Pharrell a copy of a six song EP that Spy Mob made that was the basis for us getting signed. And Pharrell had heard that we got signed to Epic and he was excited for when our record was released. We had no idea. We hardly knew who Pharrell was. We knew that he was the guy on, I'm a hustler, baby, <laughs> and I want you to know. And that's all we knew. So, for, and Pharrell had no idea that we shared the same attorney until that fateful day when Pharrell, his attorney, who is our attorney, were in the office of Polly Anthony, who's the head of Epic Records. Polly had just dropped Spy Mob a month before. We were still arguing to get the, our album back or to get a nice payout. Feelings were not happy between Polly and us and our attorney, who was now sitting in the corner while she met with Pharrell to discuss a possible deal they might do. And Pharrell says to Polly, Polly, I don't know if we're going to do business here or not, but I'm really impressed with what you guys are doing here at Epic. My favorite band is on your label. And Polly, really excited, looking at Pharrell, this taste maker, king maker, says, oh, Pharrell, I'm so happy that you like what we're doing. Who's your favorite band? And he looks at Polly and he says, Spy Mob, of course. Polly thinks that Tim, sitting in the corner, had just set her up. But Pharrell also looks at Tim like, what's, you know Spy Mob? And Tim said, I represent Spy Mob. It's a very awkward moment, but that's the meeting after which Tim called me and said, you'll never guess who's a big fan of yours. And it was shortly thereafter that Pharrell called John to go sing and play piano on uh, Mr. UFO Man, Kalisa's song. And uh, it was just a few weeks after that that Pharrell called me and said, hey, we've got this album, it's this project called Nerd, and we want to re-record this album and have live instruments on it. Do you guys want to be the band on the record? And uh, I said, well, we don't have a heck of a lot of other things going on. <laughs> so yeah, let's do it. So you obviously had this peripheral awareness of Pharrell, the Neptunes. Had you heard the original version of In Search Of at oh, that no. point? Were you aware of any of the tracks? No, we had no idea. I, and I mean, we it was. I mean, we were, we were, you know, fans of hip hop insofar as what we knew on the radio, and we had grown up with '90s hip hop, and but we were not. We were not up to date with what was going on. We had no idea what was coming down the pike, and we had no awareness of Pharrell really until that moment. So how do you then go into a project like that? Is it a case of getting a copy of the album and listening to how it sounds already, or do you just kind of almost go in cold and work on the tracks in the studio? Well, this transition was one of the most powerful musical experiences of I think any of our musical lives in spy mob. And by transition, I mean the transition from being this band that had a very tight internal language 
in a very specific way of working to taking the turn to being in an entirely different creative environment that has its own language that we were going to, that we were sort of being introduced to and that we were going to co-create with Pharrell and Chad and Shay. Spy Mob is a very buttoned up band. Everything that we did had a procedure and we didn't write songs fast. We didn't improvise except sort of in the sort of like working out what parts are going to fit, but it was very methodical. And if it didn't take a long time, we weren't doing it right. That's what our bias was. If we weren't <laughs> taking a day and a half to find just the right drum part, then it couldn't be the right drum part. Like you have to check all the boxes. You got to go through A to Z and one to a hundred. And, and we did have success in that, in, in that way. It was painful, but it was very, it was very sort of Calvinist work ethic. You pick up your hammer, you pound the nails, you pound the nails, you pound the nails. You don't sort of like throw the boards together and say art. <laughs> it's this very methodical way of working. So when we knew this session was coming up in July, uh, what year was it that we recorded it? 2001? 2001, I think, yeah. Okay, so so just months before 9-11. So in preparation for the session, yeah, we said, can you send us, send us out the Pro Tools sessions for what the existing tracks are? And the first thing we had to do was wrap our head around what this world is. I mean, we, we you know, for those... Neptune's fans that existed, they they had a context. Like they knew the old Dirty Bastard production. Like they knew they knew a context to put this sound in. Our first introduction was the digital recording of In Search of. So it, it to our ears, like and we were like it, in our arranging, maybe if you listen to spy mob recordings, we try to fill holes. Like if there's a hole there, a part belongs there. You know, if there's a, a third in a harmony, then you should probably put a fifth in a harmony unless something else is, you know, already there. So in this, in search of, we heard so many holes and we were like, well, let's fill them. So we got busy arranging parts, putting in synth parts, putting in percussion parts, uh, putting in va backing vocal ideas. Like it was... And it was a, it was a blast, but we're like, oh, there's, there are problems here. Like we, we need to, like, we, we're going to bring our arranging expertise to this. And we, I remember sending off like MP3s to Chad, like, Chad, what do you think? Like here, you know, these are some ideas. Like, what do you think? And we just didn't hear back. So Rocket Cargo comes with their big truck. It backs up to our rehearsal space. We load up all our gear because it was important to Chad and Pharrell that our instruments our vintage roads and drums and p bass and strats and tellies were the on the record which was so great i mean this was this was awesome like we didn't know what we were doing creatively yet but like we were 150 percent into this process we fly out we arrive at the studio our gear's there we set up it's day one chad's there Drew's there, the engineer. Shay's sort of floating around. And Pharrell's not there. We learn that he's recording Brandy across town and he probably won't be there much during the day. We're like, hmm, I wonder how that's going to work. And we just start laying down tracks. And we're like, well, Chad, what do you think about those ideas that we sent you? Like, what do you think about the arranging we did? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, <laughs> no. We don't need that, but thank you. Thank you. Let's do some other stuff. And we sort of waited for direction, like, okay, you don't like those ideas, so like you're going to tell us what to do. And it wasn't really him, Chad, telling us what to do. It was sort of like Drew hitting record and then Chad just waiting to see what we would do. And it was a blast. And we were expecting take after take that one's not perfect i feel you know the snare was behind on beat two and bar four like no we got to do that again no 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 we're moving on we're moving on and that's when spy mob really learned 
how to trust the moment. And it was profound. It was such a breath of fresh air to realize that, you know, after years and years and years of playing and writing and recording, that we could really trust ourselves. It, it, it took a, you know, I mean, the producers we had had also had our same sort of Calvinist work ethic. So there wasn't anyone in the room to say, nope, moving on, you got it. The inspiration was there. You said what was going to be said in the most inspired way, we're moving on. This was the first time that happened. And there are things that I hear on In Search Of where I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe, I can't believe that's on there. Or like you hear me moaning in the background of things are getting better. You've got Pharrell like doing his rhythmic breath stuff, but you also can hear me, you know, moaning, which is something that I do, but normally I like, I'll choose a take where that's not as prominent, but no, sure enough, it's in there. So that was incredible. And we recorded that whole thing in 10 days and Pharrell was never there for tracking that I can remember because he was always across town, but every night he would come back to the studio and we would listen back to everything that, that we did. And we would all just like be dancing around the studio and just super psyched about what was going on. And so when, so our education about what the Neptune sound is happened while we were creating in search of. So like we, it, it was this interesting process of like becoming a fan of that world as we were kind of co-creating a new version of it. And so, and then what happened in the years after that was just this incredible experience of, of, I mean, just meeting the fans of that world. Yes. I'm talking to you all, um, was such an inspiring, um, time in our lives. I mean, it's such a musically adventurous fan base of, of people who, I mean, I had so many fans introduce me to music. I never would have learned if it wasn't for me being in that world. And then just looking out at the audiences, you know, over those years was just an incredible time. So that, that, that shift for spy mob from the way we used to work and the music that we were making for a certain population, that transition is, was just super surprising and, and really revolutionary both personally and musically. That's one thing I always um, always did notice and always do notice still to this day when you go to um, an NERD show or for a period of time a Pharrell show, just the diversity of people that you have there from different backgrounds, ethnicities, socioeconomic differences, whatever it may be, you know, you, you've got the... Back in the day, you know, I'd go to a show and I was probably in my early 20s then and there would be the hardcore hip-hop crowd there. There would be screaming teenage girls at the front. There would be a bunch of middle-aged white guys at the back somewhere. It just had everyone and anyone. And as you say, kind of all those people with all their their own influences and interests. And it just kind of spans, you know, the, the whole board of, of music. Yeah, it was this incredible social statement that, and, and to really understand, like, because of all the different situations that I've been musically, I've really come to feel strongly that you can't understand music without its context. And so when we received In Search Of in the mail and listened to it, you know, in our home studio in Minneapolis without understanding the context, it was like, huh, I don't, I don't get it. But in context, that music became incredibly powerful to experience, even though we were making it, like it, we were experiencing it in its powerful context. And the context, half of the context was the people listening to it. So no matter where we were, you know, and like in Japan, where the audiences tended to be more homogeneous ethnically, you could still see the diversity and the, how people dressed in the color of people's hair everywhere around the world. Like if there was diversity to be had, they were there. 
And uh, yeah, just in, in just incredibly, incredibly powerful. I mean, those were unquestionably the most inspiring shows those years of of my entire musical career. And something you you mentioned a minute ago, I just want to sort of touch on it quickly. You um, you said you kind of re-recorded pretty much all of it within ten days or so. There are what thirteen tracks on the album, I think, off the top of my head, twelve or thirteen. So more than a track a day, pretty much, or thereabouts. Is that a lot quicker than you kind of expected to to kind of rattle through it all? Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean we we went out without. I don't think we had a timeline in mind. I think we were just going out and we were going to take as long as it, as, as long as it took. And I mean, it's incredible. We, I brought my, my digital video, my mini, my Sony mini digital recorder out, mini DV. I brought my camera and there's hardly any documentation of the sessions. I, I think we've got, I've got Chad and I, like, pretending we're doing a musical. I think I've got some of that. I've got just some shenanigans like happening in the studio. But this but the recording was so fast. I don't even remember the moment of recording lap dance. Like I remember coming up with like the opening and repeated like Tom Tom smashing part of Rockstar. I remember I remember the moment for, before um things are getting better. I remember feeling like that was a moment I could like do a drum fill that might, I really wanted, I was thinking of like, what is it? Michael Jackson's rock with you. Does that start with, does that rock with you? And I was thinking there's something about this song that I, I would, if I could, if I could do something at the start, that's like, memorable like that then like I can check a huge box off my my list and so I, I remember that moment I remember that moment of coming up with but other than that I remember recording the cowbell for lap dance <laughs> what else I, I don't remember a lot is my point it was a blur I remember provider I remember we turned the click off and just how floaty that tempo was and just how I had to sort of feel the push and pull of those tempos. But it's just, it's not one of those sessions that's well documented. It, it was just, even in our minds, it just flew by. You know, I'd be on take two and Chad and Drew would be saying, okay, we're done. And I was like, I've never experienced that. And when you got to the end of those 10 days and you're, you know, okay, that's it. We're, we're pretty much done here. Did you know what sort of laid ahead for you guys then in terms of continuing to work with them? Or was it just, okay, see you later, you know, we, we'll be in touch again at some point? Or Well, by then we were like, you know, we were all around 30 and we didn't, we weren't kids. So like we didn't overly invest in the promise of anything. You know, we, we loved, what we knew is that we just had the time of our lives. And we were making music that, had never been made like that fusion is so unique and for, for as much as it was appreciated by you know all you listeners and so many others like we appreciated what was happening in the moment like oh i get it i i see this um and it was so easy for us to think like oh my god i hope this turns into a world tour you know or even just one tour but we didn't know like how how important is this going to be to chad and Pharrell busy as they are with all their other productions like we just I'm sure we talked a lot about it and knowing us I'm sure we said that would be really great but we'll see so when we got the news that the record was coming out and there was tour support behind it and we were going to go to New York going to do some shows I think there was I don't know if Marty Diamond had taken the band on to tour uh to be their booking agent yet or not or I just know that we just started doing one-offs and I know that these were some of Pharrell and Ch Chad and Shay's very first performances of their life. And I know that Pharrell and Chad and Shay entrusted us with assembling the shows, creating some supportive backing tracks that we'd play and sample at certain times. 
And it was this incredibly collaborative. I mean, it was their band. It's they, these are their songs, but Spy Mob got to really bring our ideas to the recordings, and they just sort of threw the live performance at us. Like, okay, you guys tell us. You know, you know how this works. Like, what song do we play first? How do we build the arc of the set? Like, how do we finish the? How do we finish the song or the set? Oh yeah, an encore. Like, what do we do for an encore? And so it was this incredible like team effort. And then so those few shows developed into like supportive performances with other artists. And then we started doing club dates and then theater dates. And then by the end of that run, we were like doing European summer festivals. And it was, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it was a year or more of touring. And then there was time off while they recorded and recorded the instruments for Fly or Die themselves. And then it was suddenly 2003, and we were out for 18 months. It was super long, multi-global tour. Super fun. And did you feel any kind of um, pressure with some of that responsibility in terms of both as a band and being entrusted to um, put a lot of that kind of set together but then also as an individual as a drummer who kind of almost leads from the back you know I think with drummers if they don't get something quite right it's more noticeable and you're also setting the pace and the tone of a show a lot of the time as well did you kind of feel any of that or are you just kind of in that mindset when you're sat there and focused on what you have to kind of do that's a great question. I, I think a couple ways to answer that. One, um, by that point, Spy Mob had been through a lot of high pressure performance situations. I mean, just the shows to get signed were incredible p- pressure cookers. And like we involved technology into our set as well. And so we had our method down and we'd performed and recorded so much by then that um, the pressure that we felt we felt like, you know, we were, we were at the top of our game. Like we really sort of had it. We, we put the hours in and now, you know, when we performed, we could do so in a pretty relaxed way. But of course, now that you're playing with Pharrell and Chad, who are not only big shots, but their star doesn't seem to stop rising. And we knew that, you know, this was Pharrell's personal and Chad's personal musical expression. NERD was not a production for someone else. So yeah, we, there was a unique pressure there and the technology that we'd been using for spy mob that we were applying to NERD for the sample, the sampler that we were bringing into the set, the technology was getting old. So before each, each performance, Brent and I would get together and sort of like pray to the God of, musical technology that shit was going to work. Um, but the most salient, powerful presence that really put our mind at ease ev- every show was, is, is the same energy that I think Pharrell brings to his work as a producer, which is just faith. He made it so clear to us from the moment we met that he had complete faith in us musically, how we were presenting ourselves, how we were, we were representing NERD, that we felt unstoppable. And yeah, I was before every show and during every show, I was like, God, I hope, you know, I hope everything comes together. Um, because Pharrell would be changing the song order all the time, you know, so there was this definitely this sense of kind of being his musical translator on stage, you know, Pharrell wants to do this now, you know, and, you know, we might put the set together, but Pharrell could disagree with it and then say like, no, we're not going to do run to the sun tonight. You know, not with, you know, he always, if his voice wasn't up for a certain song, like he would want to cut it, then we would have to change the order on the fly. But there was never a sense that if shit got fucked up, that Pharrell was going to be mad or Chad was going to throw a fit. Like we were, there was a lot of trust and a lot of faith in in what we did. I think we just all wanted to put on a really great show. 
And um, so the pressure, I think, was just internal that we we wanted to be a great, great band. And, you know, when I look at some, listen to some of the early recordings that are on YouTube, you know, I, I, I hear the newness of it. And like we were still still getting to know the material, even though we had recorded it. But then if I listen to like the Enmore show in our, in Sydney, like a few years later, it's just like we were we were unstoppable. And 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 we, we and we felt that way. I mean, not in the beginning, but very quickly, because of the trust and faith that Chad and Pharrell and Shay had in Spy Mob and it was reciprocal. It was just an incredible sort of mutual growing experience. I think we, we talked about this briefly the other day. You know, I, back in the day, I think I probably saw you guys play at least at least a few times. I think in London, the the course of the years, and it's definitely something as a fan and as someone that listens to the music a lot that I definitely noticed as well that you grew more accustomed and comfortable to the tracks and obviously you, you're comfortable kind of playing together anyway but you definitely looked to progress um, and grow as a band over those years as well and playing those uh those sets yeah uh, that's it's so true and not not just the songs themselves but just knowing when that we can throw some interstitial stuff in between songs a lot of which was just improvised and just like knowing when you can do it and knowing when you really need to just lay back, which only happens by experimenting. But Pharrell was just always just so inviting of that. And when things didn't work, <laughs> they didn't work. And sometimes, sometimes it could be like, you know, momentarily catastrophic, which is unavoidable. But then you know that, okay, we're not going to do, we're not going to do that again. But like, there might be a time like in Bobby, Bobby James where, like I remember times I would just like decide to stop playing. Like once I kick in, then I just stop, and like there'd just be this hole. And sometimes that would feel really cool, and and then I'd do it again the next show, and then it would become permanent. And then sometimes I would do something like that one time, and Pharrell would look back at me like, "Dude, where's my spine?" And then I'd be like, "Okay, I'm not going to do that again." And over those years, um, you know, we've only touched on in search of really so far. But over the course of the recordings and stuff that you did and tracks that you worked on, what what kind of sessions did you enjoy the most? Was it those really early, more raw ones? Or are there some later ones that you really enjoyed working on? So I don't think there was a, ever a, a, a an NERD session or a Pharrell session or a Neptune session that wasn't just uh, among my favorite musical experiences. By the time that we recorded seeing sounds i had actually stopped a f- couple of years before that being a drummer for hire they in general i if a project what if i didn't have some sort of sense of ownership over a project it just wasn't interesting to me I, and um but for all the all the projects i did with the neptunes that I always felt a connection to that and of course a history and going into seeing sounds like there there wasn't a specific group of songs that I remember that was going to be the album I just remember being presented with beat after beat after beat after beat after beat and I uh, I mean just it's sort of like in in search of there there was not this sort of like methodical way we were going about making the recordings. There were some songs that stuck out. Um, I remember spending an entire evening on Killjoy, which to me is just one of the most killer NERD tracks ever. Like I think that 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 groove is so fierce. (laughs) There's some some big drums in there. um, There are. There, there are, and I'm, I am super proud of that, that track, but that, as an example, as one example of Brent's right hand, and what's happening between the hi hat and snare drum. That to me is, it just, 
I, I can't even describe it. I can't tell you exactly what it is about it. I just know that I feel really happy when I listen to that track. And for whatever reason, I go months or year, you know, I'm sure I've gone over a year without listening to that track. But then when I happen to put it on or decide to put it on, oh my God, I just, I, I love that track. And we we spent all night working on that drum groove or all afternoon working on the drum groove and then all night on Brent's guitars and then layering them, deciding when to put the octave on. And I have, I have video of that. Steve, I'll share it with you. It's, it's sick. It's sick. I would love to see some of that stuff. Oh my God. It's so great. Um, and just in the, the kind of the interest of time here, uh, don't want to keep you too long. Waste your day doing a podcast. But what, when you look back now, what you mentioned one track there, obviously you really like. W- which ones did you really love playing live? Which, are, which, which ones did you really look forward to actually doing there in front of a crowd? You know, looking at a set list would probably help. But, I mean, my first... I guess I, the the obvious, for me, the obvious answer is lap dance. It, it was always... It, 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 you, you can't put that song anywhere but at the end because it can't get higher than that. The... It's just such a, I mean, I, I said that Killjoy is a fierce song. Lap Dance is a fierce song. And it was always the song where if there was anyone at the side of the stage, often there were famous people there. Often there were not famous people there. There were just people or friends of the band or friends of the production people. Pharrell would bring him out on stage <laughs> and everyone had to jump. Everyone had to dance. Pharrell would bring up random people out of the crowd and it was a party. And often the party meant that someone was kicking over, you know, Brent's effects rack or unplugging Twig's guitar. Um, people would be up on my drum throne dancing with me. And in the meantime, it's just like mayhem. It's mayhem of people. It's mayhem of music. And I, re- you know, the click is pounding in my ear. And it's my job to keep everything grooving so that when I'm hearing the sample of the cowbell in the verse, that I'm perfectly subdividing it. I'm getting super drum geeky here. But what I loved most is keeping the semblance of the groove going while the world is falling apart all around. Despite all the chaos. Right, right. And there are lots of places on YouTube where you can see lap dance. It's always the last song. And I actually put a, if you you go to the Eric Fawcett YouTube channel, you can see that I strung together all my favorite live videos of lap dance in. I watched that the other day, actually, yeah. Oh, cool. So it's like, it's just one perform. It's like sewn together as one performance but it's like eight different performances over like a few years. And, you know, and we, I I could do it because we played it to a click, but the feeling has to be that it's just completely out of control. But that said, like the truth, the truth is that what was so great was building up to that moment, like lap dance in a vacuum. It's like a, it, it was a, the reason why it was such a great time is that we built there. You know, there was Provider in there where we get to like super chill out. There was Bobby James, you know, and later on, you know, that it was really about building up to that moment. But I loved, you know, when we had our full set of lights and the sound was great and we were in a theater, for some reason, every time we got to Bobby James and those spaced out early chords chad's chords come in that was always just a musical moment and it's you know no drums in the beginning which i always love an opportunity just to listen and not play and then when the drums kick in you know in verse two it was just always like yeah now we're now we're rocking that's one track i know myself and a lot of other fans really miss uh seeing live these days i remember back in the day it would be the one that people in the crowd would would scream for 
and when it would come on, people would know obviously every word to it and everyone would sing along. But then obviously as everything has grown and most of the shows nowadays, at least in you know, the past few years and the last couple of albums, there aren't those kind of smaller, more intimate gigs now. They are big summer festival tours and it's not necessarily a track that would work particularly well on a Saturday night in front of, you know, 50,000 drunk people. Yeah, it's definitely evolved into something where that that wouldn't be as as appropriate. But believe me, I'm sympathetic to your perspective. <laughs> and for anyone out there who's really excited about the idea of uh, a one-time vintage NERD performance, just know that I'm completely up for it. As much as I love all the guys in the new band who I'm happy to call buddies and um, love keeping up with what they're doing because the band is still incredible. It's just different. Everybody you heard, you need to uh, make sure you at Pharrell, at Chad. Uh, tell them you want Spy Mob back together. You want to see them again. Just do a one-time thing. Tyler, the creator, has been shouting for it. At Tyler as well, yes. I'm sure... Uh... I'm sure if he uh, if he had his way, he has he has the ear of these people as well. So yeah, you ne- you never know, you never know. Just very quickly before we go, um, let's mention a few of the bits that you're you're actually up to nowadays. Recently, you had a project with uh, Brent and Drew doing um, a, a splice music pack that's becoming quite popular now. I see. I know. I know. Chad put one out a little while back as well. Yeah, we uh, Brent and Drew engineering and Brent on guitar and me on drums and Brent and I both throwing synthesizer parts in there. We created a sample pack for all you musicians. Um, We were approached by a popular, I'll just say a popular pad, trigger pad company to create a sample pack in the spirit of NERD. We thought that was a great idea. We weren't really psyched with how this particular company goes about marketing these things. So we decided to just do this on our own and uh, put it out on Splice. And it's now out and it's called Grooves from Outer Space, Volume 1. The implication being that there will be a Volume 2, um, which is actually all recorded. We just have to get Drew to engineer and uh, put some um, final shine on the mixes. But yeah, if you want a toolkit for creating vibes and sounds kind of in the spirit of that spaced out vintagey meets contemporary funk check out grooves from outer space yeah definitely i know uh brent had on his instagram a little while back um six or seven little kind of video clips of him playing different bits and pieces from that so if you are interested in that then Obviously, go and check out his Instagram and get a, a small taste of it and then get onto Splice and you can download that as well as uh, Chad's pack, which is on there, uh, which is all kind of Neptune's influenced and, and many others, I'm sure, as well. Aside from that, I see you've also got a couple of other little, um, well, I was going to say side projects. They're probably not side projects. They're your, your, your main business now, I guess. Um, should we mention uh, Egg? Sure. Yeah. So, you know what, Parenthood, meant for me and the way that, uh, again, when I talk to uh, students and music schools and I emphasize that it's, you know, your life is going to change as you move through a creative career. And for me, parenthood meant that I just didn't want to be on the road as much. And so a business partner, a great creative collaborator, buddy of mine named John Hermanson and I, in 2007, started a company that creates and licenses music for film and TV and advertising. And so we still do that, still do that today. And when musical projects come up that are exciting, whether it's in the studio or performing, I, I'll take them. But I love being able to partner with entities that are creating video and finding great music for that. Yeah, I did notice on your, your website, which is, I think it's egg-music.com for people that want to check it out. You've, uh, you've got some big clients there. You've done some, uh, some fairly sort of well-known stuff. We have. Yeah, we've been fortunate in that way. It was, you know, when, when we had to transition from the music industry to the ad industry, it's totally different. 
world with totally different vernacular and ways of referring to things. But uh, it's 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 great. We basically have to go from one creative circle partnership to another, often many times a day, as our you know creative teams shift from one ad agency to another to that TV show. So there's there's no shortage of variety. I know there's a few listeners uh, of the podcast that are in the the ad agency that do make adverts and things like that. So if you need some music, this is obviously your man to get in touch with. So Holla. make sure you go and, go and check out that website, egg-music.com. There will be a link in the show notes. And in terms of um, your own kind of music, your own kind of personal stuff, you're still playing, you're still doing stuff, you still do you still record anything on the side or... You know, it's it. Some years I'd say, yeah, I just finished three projects, and then this year I can say it's I have had really zero inspiration to do to do much. Like a you know a common theme in my in my life is if if there's a real purpose driven reason to sit behind drums and play, I'll do it. And when Grooves from Out of Space that project came up, I spent all summer last summer behind the drums actually right behind me here in my studio just in this in this basement i just spent all summer in the basement just sweating my ass off and playing groove after groove after groove and just had such a great time and then when that project is done it's like doop to do <laughs> i'm fine not drumming um but you know if, if too long a period goes goes on i i try to manufacture a reason. In fact, this last, if you go into my Instagram, Steve, um, you can see this last weekend, a friend set up two drum sets in his basement and we just played all afternoon and just had a, had a great, I saw your video on the, uh, had a great time. So it had been many months since I sat behind a drum set, but sometimes you just got to get those synapses firing again. I can imagine that that's what happens with creative people. I think it's, if it's that deep inside you, you have to have that release at some point in time. Yep. Yeah, let's sort of wrap it up there, I guess, for now. Uh, a couple of quick bits of news before we just close uh, the whole thing. Um, slightly under the radar, a new Pharrell Neptune's track, uh, Letter to My Godfather from the Netflix movie The Black Godfather. There's uh, the audio version, which is on YouTube at the moment. I think you can stream it in all the usual places. Um, not your normal Neptunes kind of track. Uh, very, very different, but a a very, um, I would say, touching song. Beautiful song almost. Um, I've given it a few listens. I need to listen to it a little bit more. It does go five and a half minutes long, I think. So it's quite a long track. But But that came out last week. And then also for all of you old school Neptunes fans, um, Khaleesi's Wonderland is now finally available on all of the streaming services as of uh, the end of last week, I believe. Obviously, this was never released in the US due to label issues, um, but it did come out in uh, various places in Europe. But if you are in the US, you can now stream that. If you are in Europe, there are some limitations as to some of the songs that are available. Uh, I know when I added it the other day to Apple Music, everything was available. But then when I went to play it today, five of the songs, I think, were unavailable here in Finland. So uh, people in different countries, you may or may not um, see differing track lists and things like that. But that is now finally available for all to listen to. So go and check that out. All right. Well, I think that is it for this week. Um, you can find all of the information uh, on the podcast, all of the show notes, all that jazz, obviously, down in the show notes, but also on the website at theothers.net, obviously, others with a Z. You can find me at Steve R. Penny on Instagram. And Eric, if people want to come in, stalk you, follow you, see what you're up to, is there a place in which they can do so? Yeah, if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can find me at Eric Fawcett. All right, lovely stuff. And there'll be a link in the show notes to that and the various websites and videos and whatnot that we've uh, mentioned throughout the podcast. So that's it for this week. Eric, once again, thank you very, very much. Uh, I really appreciate your time um, and I'm sure everyone else listening also appreciates your time. And as as you mentioned, uh, let's at everybody and uh, get the band back together, as they say. I love it. Steve, thanks so much. It was an honor. 
Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. Um, and that's it, everyone. So I'll speak to you next time. Bye-bye. Uh-huh.